All right, kiddos, we're back. We're continuing to discuss chapter one, the study of matter. And we're going to talk about different states of matter today to begin with. And then we're going to talk about some properties of matter, talk about physical, and hopefully we'll get to chemical properties. So first, let's talk about states of matter. You've heard of these three before. Solid, we usually abbreviate in parentheses with the small letter S after it. If you have a liquid, we'll use parentheses and put an L. And of course, with the gas, we'll put a little G in there. So solid liquid gas. We'll see this symbolism a lot throughout the year. Okay? Now, solids are a form of matter with a definite shape. And volume. And they are incompressible. If I could get my fingers to work there. Incompressible. So if I take a look at this picture here, this is just a rock. Of course, you know a rock is a solid. It doesn't take the shape of its container. It doesn't occupy the volume of its container, and it's incompressible. If you looked at the particles that made up a rock, those particles would form what we call a crystalline lattice. They're very, very uniformly, dist uh, uniformly distributed. And because those particles are so close to each other, we can't compress them at all. So solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. They do not occupy the entire volume of their container. And they are incompressible because the particles that make up the solid are so close together, we can't push them any closer together. Liquids, they are a form of matter that flows. So liquids are a form of matter that flows. They have a constant volume. and they take the shape of their container. So, if we take a look at this picture here of the particles that make up a, a, a liquid. Let's just pretend that these little yellow spheres represent water molecules. You're, you'll notice that they're not as uh, rigidly arranged as were solids. These particles can flow past one another. This water molecule can flow and end up being over here later, and maybe up here, and maybe down there. They can move past one another. However, they are still very close to each other. So essentially, liquids are incompressible. But because of their ability to flow, they take the shape of their container. Now, they do have a definite volume because they can take up the entire space of their container. So for instance, here I'm showing juice bottles that are completely full of juice. But if I only filled this halfway, obviously it would not take up the entire volume of the container. They're stuck to each other. They're attracted to each other, so to speak. Okay? And finally, gases. Gases are a form of matter that also flow. And I'll show you a picture to illustrate why in just a minute. Um, they conform to the shape of their container. So they flow to conform to the shape of their container. And they will occupy the entire volume of the container. And one more thing about gases you'll see. The particles are not stuck. They're not really close to each other. There's lots of space between individual gas particles. So they are easily compressed. So if we take a look at these particles here, let's say that these are, I don't know, oxygen molecules. Okay, and they're inside their container. Notice they occupy the entire volume of their container. They can flow. This particle here can end up over here. Maybe it can end up down here, up over here. It occupies the entire volume of its container. Here's a little sunflower balloon. So it takes the shape of its container, and those gas particles occupy the entire volume of their container. Essentially, well, for all intents and purposes, if we treat them ideally, these gas particles are not attracted to each other, so they're not going to condense that easily, 
and once again they can flow easily past one another. So you should be familiar with solids, liquids, and gases and their differences. Okay? Alright, next up let's talk about some chemical and physical properties of matter. So we'll first address physical properties of matter. Physical properties of matter are properties of matter that can be um, observed without changing the sample's composition. So we can observe these properties without changing the composition, the sample's composition. So, I don't know, for example, um, the volume. Um, maybe we could look at um, the color. That would be a good example of a physical property of something. When we observe the volume or the color, we're not changing the composition. So, this Apple Pencil happens to be white. Okay, the chalkboard in my room happens to be green. Um, the chair you might be sitting in is red. We're not changing the composition of your substance by observing its color. The amount of space it takes up. Once again, we're not changing its composition. Let me give you another example. How about melting point? Some people might say, well, Hummer, you're changing the substance's composition by observing its melting point. So you have an ice cube, Hummer, and then that ice cube melts. You no longer have solid water, you have liquid... Oh, you still have liquid water. So you have not changed the sample's composition, have you? So you can find the temperature at which water melts, and that would be a physical property of that water. Now, physical properties can be categorized as either extensive or intensive. Extensive properties are physical properties that depend upon the amount of substance present. So these depend upon the amount. Up. Let's go back a couple, clear that up. The amount of substance present. So, for example, if I were to say um, this Apple Pencil is about 9 inches long, that depends upon the amount of stuff I have in my hand. Um, so length would be a good example of an extensive physical property. Mass would be a good example. The amount something weighs depends upon how much stuff you have. Volume, again, would be a good example of a physical property that is extensive. Now what do you think intensive is? If extensive depends upon the amount of substance present, intensive, you're right, it does not depend on the amount of substance present. So, let me give you an example of that. If I said, um, oh, I don't know, a piece of paper burns. Well, I actually just messed up here because burning is actually a, uh, a chemical property. So maybe I won't use that as my example. Maybe I could say something that does not depend upon, how about color? the chair you're sitting on is red. If I take a small piece of that chair or a big piece of that chair, it's still going to be red. So it does not depend upon the amount of substance present. How about density? Yeah, density we're going to learn about later um, in this chapter. It's the mass per unit volume of something. Gold has a high density. However, something like air has a very low density. Well, let's talk specifically about the density of gold. If I have a small piece of gold, it has this particular density. If I have a swing pool full of gold, the density is still the same. Sure, the volume is increased, but the mass of that is increased right along with it. So something like color or density do not depend upon the amount of substance present. So that would be an intensive physical property. 
and then chemical properties. Let's see, physical properties are properties that we can observe without changing the sample's composition. Chemical properties are, that's right, we're going to observe them and they have the potential to change the sample's composition. So it's the ability or inability It's supposed to be a Y there, kiddos, of a substance to combine with or change into one or more new substances. Now, I know this is a little bit sloppy, but I repeat things a couple times for you. So the ability or inability of a substance to combine with or change into one or more, more new substances. So now let's talk about gasoline burning. So when gasoline burns, when I'm all finished with that change, do I still have gasoline? No, it's turned into carbon dioxide and water vapor. I now have one or more new substances. So the property of gasoline burning would be considered a chemical property. Now, it also says the ability or inability of a substance to combine with or change into one or more new substances. What if I were to say helium gas, the chemical symbol for helium is HE, -E, does not burn. It's not flammable. Well, that's still a chemical property of helium. It looks like he does not burn. So maybe I should write helium here for you. Okay, the ability or inability of a substance to combine with or change into one or more new substances is a chemical property. So something being flammable, like gasoline, it burns, or not flammable, like helium, it does not burn. Those both would be considered chemical properties. So, let's try a few and see if we can answer these correctly. I want you to identify the following as either chemical or physical properties. So let's see. Copper conducts electricity. Huh. Now let's see. Am I changing that into one or more new substances? Or am I not changing it? See, after it conducts electricity, I still have copper, don't I? I haven't changed it at all. So copper would be, or copper conducting electricity would be a physical property. Would that be extensive or intensive? Will a large piece of copper conduct electricity? Hmm. Can a small piece of copper conduct electricity? Hmm. It does not depend upon how much copper I have. So that would be an intensive physical property of copper. Sugar dissolves in water. Now this one's tricky. A lot of kids miss this one. Sugar dissolves in water. After sugar has dissolved in water, don't I still have sugar in water? Isn't the sample's composition still the same? I haven't changed it chemically. I still have sugar and I still have water. I just have sugar dissolved in water. So this also is a physical property. And once again, um, a small amount of sugar will dissolve in water, one teaspoon will dissolve in a gallon of water, or a cup will dissolve in a gallon of water. So it does not make a difference how much I have, it will still um, dissolve in water. So that would be an intensive physical property. Now, copper reacts with. Key here is reacts with. When I react copper with nitric acid, I no longer have copper metal, and I no longer have nitric acid. I've made copper nitrate, a poisonous gas, nitrogen dioxide, and some water. I ended up uh, changing it into one or more new substances. So this would be a chemical property of copper. Gasoline is flammable. We just noted that over here. That's also a chemical property. You've made one or more new substances. The density of water is one gram for every milliliter. Well, we said density up here was a physical property. And once again, it doesn't make a difference if I have a gallon of water or a drop of water, it will still have the same uh, density. 
So that would be an intensive physical property. Iron rusts when exposed to air. So let's see, we start with iron, and we start with, it's the oxygen in the air that it reacts with kiddos. We end up with a new chemical compound, iron oxide, which is commonly called rust. We've changed it into one or more new substances. So this is a chemical property of iron. Lead is malleable. Malleable means when I pound it with a hammer, I'm going to dent it. It's not brittle. It can be bent or dented when I hit it with a hammer. After I do that, don't I still have lead? Yeah, I have not changed its composition. I still have lead. So this is a physical property of lead. And once again, it's an example of an intensive physical property of lead. So, just to wrap this up, let me just go through these two charts in your notes. Physical properties of some common substances. Oxygen, colorless, that's a physical property. So is water. Sugar, sucrose, is white. Sodium chloride is white. Those are all physical properties. The state at 25 degrees Celsius, which is about room temperature. Oxygen's a gas. Water's a liquid. Sugar's a solid. And so does table salt, sodium chloride. And boiling points. Um, those would be physical properties. When it says decomposes, that means it will actually uh, break down into something similar, simpler. So that right there we could question. Since it doesn't boil, it decomposes first. That would be a chemical property. Some physical properties of copper. We have its color. It's malleable. It can be drawn into wires. It's ductile, etc. And then there are some chemical properties. Forms green copper carbonate compounds when in contact with moist air. Reacts with nitric acid, as we said earlier, and sulfuric acid forming new substances. And one type of a compound forms a deep blue solution when in contact with ammonia. All right, to wrap this up, let's see if we can identify the following as either being extensive or intensive properties. Remember, extensive does depend upon the amount of matter we have. Intensive does not. So try these four quickly. You might want to pause the video for a minute. All right, and now let me do them for you. A piece of gold has a mass of 10 grams. Hmm, that's mass. That depends upon how much gold we have. So we would call that extensive. Gold is an unreactive metal. Does it make a difference how much gold we have, a small amount or a large amount? It does not. So that would be an intensive property of gold. A piece of silver has a volume of one cubic centimeter. Yeah, that does depend upon how much stuff we have. So that would be extensive. And water is colorless. A drop of water or a swimming pool of water is still going to be colorless. It does not depend upon how much we have. So that's intensive. All right, kiddos, that wraps it up for today. Take care. Bye-bye.